Hello, biology students. Mrs. Smith here. I'm going to be watching a little video to help you complete your fish respiration pre-lab. Make sure you have something to write with, preferably a pencil. Also, make sure you have your fish respiration lab template because you'll be filling out the information as we go through this video. All right, let's get started. First of all, what are we going to be doing during this lab? We'll be increasing and decreasing the temperature of the water in order to determine its effect on the respiration rate of a goldfish. So we'll be getting to the procedure a little bit later on, but just a quick overview. You'll have just a standard goldfish, probably seen them before, I've had them as a pet, in a beaker. And we will be increasing the temperature with hot water, decreasing the temperature with ice cubes, and then counting the respiration rate of the goldfish during various trials in order to figure out uh, what the effect of water temperature has on the respiration rate of a goldfish. At this point, you should be able to complete two different sections of your lab template. You should be able to complete the title of the experiment. You should also be able to complete the problem, making sure you write your problem as a question. All right, moving on. How do fish respire? Fish go through respiration using a structure called gills. You've probably heard of gills before. Many aquatic organisms have them, and they are feathery structures specialized for the exchange of gases with water. Now, you do not have gills. You have lungs. Your lungs function in pulling oxygen out of the air and putting carbon dioxide back into the air as a waste product. And because fish live under the water, they're going to use a different structure. So their gills do kind of like what your lungs do. They pull oxygen out of the water and then release carbon dioxide as a waste product backed into it. If you look at this picture right here, you can see uh, part of the operculum, which is an arch that covers the gills, uh, allows you to see the gills right here. You can see there's many arches. This picture right here is also showing the gills. You can see there's many layers of gills, and it's also showing how water flows in through the mouth and then out the gills. This picture right here is showing the same thing, but it is showing an open mouth versus a closed mouth. So if you look right here, this is showing that the mouth is open, the water draws in. Then over here, when the mouth closes, you can see the mouth is closed, it pushes and forces the water to go past the gills, and then the gills will get the oxygen by diffusion. And because of this, one of the ways we will be able to count the respiration rate of our goldfish is by watching the opening and closing of the mouth. So you can see the mouth opens, the mouth closes. That is going to be one ventilation or one um, part of its respiration rate. Another way you'll be able to watch the respiration rate of your goldfish is by watching the opening and closing of the operculum. Again, the operculum is this bony arch that's going to cover and kind of protect the gills. Uh, the operculum is being pointed at right here. And every time a fish has one ventilation, its operculum will open and close. All right, what structures are necessary for respiration? Obviously the gills, but there's more involved. The gills are actually made up of, if we look right here, gills are made up of gill filaments. There are thousands of tiny little thread-like filaments, all of them that are rich in capillaries. A capillary is a blood vessel that will help draw oxygen in by diffusion. So water is pumped past thousands of thread-like gill filaments, which are rich with capillaries. Filaments absorb oxygen from the water which is for the respiration process, and releases carbon dioxide gas, which is a waste product from the process. The operculum, which we saw on the previous slide, is another important structure for respiration. It is going to be the gill cover. Our last structure, which is actually how the process starts, is with the mouth. So the mouth is actually a muscular pump, and this pump is going to pull water in through the mouth, and as it shuts, it will push the water back past the gills. At this point, you should be able to complete the first paragraph of the concepts section of your lab report. All right, moving on. All right, up next we need to do a little bit of research to complete the second concepts paragraph. Our first, first Google search is going to be water temperature versus dissolved oxygen. So if we're on Google, we want water temperature versus dissolved oxygen. Now anytime you're doing research in this class, it's a good idea to find 
resources where the websites end in .gov or .edu or .org. Uh, wikis are generally not considered reliable sources. .com, some of them are, some of them are not. So you want to pro um, kind of focus on edu, gov, and org. So if you look at the first couple that come up on our search, we can see this one right here, USGS. That's a United States Geological Service. That would be uh, a very excellent resource. And what we're trying to figure out is what is the relationship between dissolved oxygen and the temperature of water. And if you go to this website, which you should be able to do, you can read and read and read. And then you get to this very important chart right here. If you start reading, it says, as this chart shows, the concentration of dissolved oxygen in surface water is controlled by temperature, has both seasonal and daily cycles. Cold water can hold more oxygen, more dissolved oxygen than warm water. And our data is going to prove that here. If you look at this blue line, that's the water temperature. If you look at this black line, it is dissolved oxygen. So you can see when the water temperature is low, the dissolved oxygen is high. If we come over here, we have low dissolved oxygen and high water temperature. So you need to think about what type of relationship that is. Is it a direct relationship? Is that an indirect relationship? Or is that a constant relationship? If you forgot which, um, what those different relationships mean, go ahead and look back at your graphing information that we have recently completed. That will show you good uh, diagrams of what it means. Now. To help you come up with your concepts, you can read through a bit more of this information. Another good thing you could do is to also do, oops, you could also do an images search of the same topic and pick out a graph. Graphs are a great way to determine relationships. So we can pick this one. This is showing temperature versus dissolved oxygen. You can see as temperature increases, the amount of dissolved oxygen gets lower. And we've seen this type of slope of line in graphs before, so that should help you determine whether it's a direct, indirect, or constant relationship. All right, our second Google search is going to be for something called ectotherm. Ectotherm literally translates as outside heat. So if we go back to Google, and type in ectotherm. We're on images first, so let's take a look. Again, remember graphs are always very good. We can see a bobcat, which is an endotherm because it's a mammal. A snake is an ectotherm. That's an example. A fish is also an ectotherm. As you can see, as the temperature, ambient just means of the environment, as the environmental temperature increases, the temperature of the ectotherm also increases. You may have heard an, another term for ectotherm before. They're also known as cold-blooded animals. So the fish that you'll be working with in this lab is a cold-blooded animal, and as a result, its body temperature is going to vary with the environment. We can also do a text. If you see Wikipedia, we want to skip that, even though it does say .org. We don't want to use wikis. But here is biologyonline.org, and you can see an ectotherm, an animal whose body temperature varies with the temperature of its surrounding. Cold-blooded animals cannot regulate their body temperature. So think about what type of relationship you think there is between the metabolic rate of a fish and go up to here, the metabolic rate, and the temperature of the water it is in. So you should be able to make some inferences based on what we just talked about in order to answer concepts paragraph two. If you'd like to do more research to help you come up with a more complete answer, that is fine as well. All right, moving on. All right, let's hypothesize. Next section of your pre-lab. It says, remember, the independent variable is the factor that is varied in an experiment and specifically controlled by the experimenter. So think about what we've been talking about so far. What is it that you, as the experimenter, will be changing in the lab? That is your independent variable. And it says, remember, the dependent variable is the factor that is measured or observed in an experiment. So what is it that you are observing? What is it that you're trying to figure out? What is it that you're collecting data about? That is your dependent variable. All right, a good experiment is always controlled. So in this experiment, you're only changing one variable. You are changing the water temperature. In order to keep this controlled, 
so that only the water temperature is changing. You need to make sure that everything else is the same. So this is something you just kind of have to think about. What other factors could change the outcome of the experiment? I'm going to give you an example. The type of fish. What if we were all using a different species of fish? Some people had goldfish, some people had a bass, some people had a Siamese fighting fish. It wouldn't be a controlled experiment because each different type of species might have its own standard respiration rate that is different from all the other species. So one of the controlled variables that we want is the species of fish. So you can write that one down on your lab report and then try to think of at least three more factors that could change the outcome of our experiment, but we don't want them to change it, so we're going to keep them constant or controlled. Underneath that, you see the control group. The control group is going to be under normal conditions, while the experimental group is under changed conditions. In order to figure those out, you're going to need to read the procedure. If you go to the classroom website, click on the biology page in our intro to science page. Hopefully this looks familiar to you. If you scroll down, you can see on day seven, we're completing the fish respiration lab. And when you click on it, it will bring up dun, 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 the lab procedure. So read through the lab procedure. You should be able to figure out what is considered normal conditions and what is considered changed conditions to fill out that part of your lab write-up. So if we go ahead and take a look, you should now be able to fill out the entire hypothesis template. When you get down to this part right here where it says because and you're coming up with an explanation, you should be able to figure this out using all the information that has been talked about so far. You're also welcome to do a little bit of extra research if you want to try to get uh, a better answer or maybe just a better explanation to help you. If we're moving on to the back now, we're getting to materials and equipment. To figure out materials and equipment, you need to read through the procedure like we just saw. Materials will be discarded at the end and equipment can be reused in future experiments. I want you to figure out at least two to three materials and seven to eight equipment and add them onto your lists. The last section is safety. In order to fulfill the safety section, you want to look at your safety contract from those first couple days of school and try to figure out two to three safety precautions that directly pertain to this lab. If you're like, wait a second, I lost my safety precautions. They are located on the classroom website. We go back to the intro to science. If you click on course policy, you'll see um, the safety information in there. But if not, you can always email me and I can send this to you. Here's our safety contract. Again, make sure they pertain to the lab. So for example, where it says dispose of chemical waste properly, properly, that would not be a good safety precaution for this lab because we are not using chemical substances. So make sure after you've read through the procedure, you know kind of what the lab is about and that will allow you to find a couple of safety precautions to write about. Last thing, friendly reminder, your entire pre-lab must be completed at the beginning of class on lab day in order to participate in the lab with your class. The following sections are the title, the concepts, the hypothesis, the materials, the equipment, and the safety. So if you've been following along this video, you should have all of those sections completed. And that goes up to here, describe safety precautions necessary. If you'd like to work ahead and create a data table, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll be working that on during class on our lab day. If you have any questions, make sure you send me an email or come see me before or after school. That is all for today.